Mythology. Mythology. What is mythology? Everyone get down, this is a mythology. Is this a mythology? Take me to the treasure room, I want to see it. I will speak the magic words. Open sesame. <gasps> I knew they were hiding it. Anyway, here's that deposit I wanted to make. Aha, what's this? The mythological holy grail. I won't be needing this for another six months. All this and more on this episode of In the Quarantine. Do you know the story of Orpheus? Is that the guy that travels down to Hades? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know this one. Yeah, this is a good one. Okay. Everyone loves this theremin player, including, what was her name? Eurydice? Uh, Eurydice. Okay. Yeah. And they fall in love and mm. all is well. So she's a beautiful woman and he loves her very much and he plays beautiful music for her and the music makes everyone happy and it's it's more than just that. It also encourages things to grow and everyone loves this dude. And his lady walks off, goes into the forest and there, I think she's running away and she gets bitten by a snake. She was in a NordVPN ad. It was region locked, so they couldn't suck out the poison. And so she died and she went down to Hades. He named it after himself, which, yeah. you know, that just <laughs> saves time, yeah. I suppose. It might be a little yeah. bit confusing. Oh, I'm going to Hades. Oh, how was he? Oh, well, I didn't actually see him, but I went to his house. So Orpheus finds his wife dead and is stricken. So he has to go get his wife back from Hades. So he walks to Hades through like a hole mm -hmm. in the ground, I believe. Yes. He goes down these thousands and thousands of steps and he reaches the river Styx. And there he sees the boatman. The boatman. I like the, to think of the boatman with like headphones on. He's not really that <laughs> enthusiastic about his job. No, well, why would you be at that point? Yeah, <laughs> same old, same old. <laughs> <laughs> what what do you want? Hi, yeah, I'm Orpheus. Um, I'm a pretty major musician in the upper world. You might have heard of me. Nope. Okay, well, it's that's good to, that I reminded you of it then. Anyway, um, I'm I'm new in town, and I'm looking for the best boat service possible to get me straight to Hades. The guy, not the place. Well, it's just me, and you're not getting on because you clearly alive. Well, I mean, I don't think you should hold it against me. What is this? <laughs> oh, I didn't expect to run into such prejudice in this eternal <laughs> lake of fire and sinners. Oh, well, I, I mean, I don't mean to discriminate. Uh, I mean, I, I was, some of my best friends are alive. Where can you take me? What part of hell can you take me that's close? Listen, you can't, you can't get on the boat. People need to pay me to get on this boat. You know, man's got to make a living. I don't know what I do with the cash. I don't know why there is a toll to pay for this ferry. Because to be honest, I just take all these coins and I, I put them over here in this big pile. It's kind of like a Scrooge McDuck thing. Listen, um, I'm not a man easily convinced. You're either dead or you're not getting on the boat. What if I told you that this was a mission for love? I wouldn't be moved. Unless there was some sort of music that you were going to play on the lyre. What can persuade this boatman, I wonder to myself? Perhaps a banging tune on my lyre. Yeah, right, I'm going to take off my headphones. Go on. Can you do Toto? Africa? I like that one. Oh yeah, of course. That's what every lyre player knows how to do Toto. Do -do 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 rain, rain. Raining <laughs> men, raining men. Oh, that's another song. Uh, that will do. <laughs> you know what? I'm convinced. That's some. That's a beautiful tune. I'm so moved. I'm going to take you down the river. Terrific. Uh, what, wipe your shoes first. Sure. <laughs> what am I seeing in hell? Oh man, there's a whole bunch of lost souls underneath you. Yeah, you get used to the wailing. Over there's a fire. Oh, it doesn't go out for some reason. Um. <sighs> Uh, I don't know what else there is down here, to be honest. Last and only stop. D uh, don't forget to give me a good rating on Uber. Sure, no worries. Five stars, please. <laughs> Thanks. Surely it'd be lift <laughs> as hell. <laughs> what, no tip? It's bottle of water in the back. I would have given a tip, but the whistle stop tour of the adulterers lining up in front of a little guillotine really bummed me out. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, you get down to Hades. Fee fi fo farm, who's this? Great Lord Hades, it is I, Orpheus, famous musician of the overground. Who? Oh? Don't worry about it. People know me. It's okay. Anyway, <laughs> I'm here for my girlfriend. You've got her, and I'd like to take her back to the top world. Please and thank you. I don't think so, actually. Once someone comes down to Hades, they don't ever leave. And my wife's here to back me up. Oh, 
yeah, yeah, no, actually, you don't get to leave. And you know what? I'm a pretty big deal. So I'm going to have a second wife. And you know what? Her name's going to be Eurysidae. What? Oh, Hades, you're out of line. Two wives, isn't it? Twice as good. Oh, but she's my wife. Well, I'm in charge. That's true. Uh, but I feel like I can persuade you by... Do, 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 do. Toto in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Crack, crack in tune. You know what? I think it's good. But I am still unmoved. But... Oh, hold on a minute. Oh, my wife. Oh, she's crying. She is moved. Oh, please, Hades. Oh, please, let him have his wife back. You know what? I'm going to make you a deal. This one time, I'm going to let someone have their wife back. But, special conditions. She's going to leave behind you. And she will not make any noise whatsoever. But you must not turn around to see that she is there. And if you do turn around, then she will be mine forever. I'm just making notes as you say this. So, got it. Walking behind me. Yep. Don't turn around. Yep. Got it. Well, that seems simple enough there, Hades. I'm sure that won't be a problem. All right, have you go. Out through the little fire exit. I believe he plays the liar on the way out to try and guide her out or something like that. This guy is very self-involved, isn't he? He's always... Every solution involves the liar. Yep. It's like Wolverine. Every solution is the claws. So he walks out. For some reason, he, I mean, he wants to look behind him because he, he can't hear her. So he he looks. <gasps> no, don't look. And she just is there. And then she just slowly gets like pulled back into hell. Do you remember what happens next? A bit of a blur from here. I think Orpheus is pretty upset about what went down. Sure is. Probably plays a sad song on the lyre to himself. More than just a sad song. So there he is. And it's driving everyone mad. If I remember correctly, women are miscarrying, people are killing themselves, crops aren't growing properly. That is a bad song. That's a, that's a bad song. And he's playing this way for days and days. And then eventually the villagers go, fuck this. And they decide to uh, kill him. I'm reading it here. It's a group of irate women. They've called it, which <laughs> I think is <laughs> very funny. Um, they, the women kill him and cut his body into pieces and throw him and his liar into the river. Outrageous. <laughs> that's Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. Poor Orpheus. I don't know if it's going to be trite to point out the whole problem with Icarus. I suppose the Greeks have never been up high before. And they didn't, they just didn't know that actually things get colder up there. And, and anyway, he's flying along and the wings are made of feathers and wax. And uh, apparently the wax melts, but that doesn't make no sense because it gets colder, innit? You know, I've never considered that aspect of the myth. You know, you've got your time machine mm. and you go back to ancient Greece to find whoever made this myth because obviously you need to correct them with all the yes. intensity of a someone in the comments who needs to correct your... Uh, incorrect facts. Yeah, like a scorning teacher. Exactly. Actually, Daedalus, or whoever told this <laughs> myth, actually, uh, when you go up high, it actually gets colder. Do you know much about Socrates? Socrates? From most descriptions, he was just like a rambling madman who walked around with no shoes on, but everyone thought he was pretty wise. There were people who were more rambling and more mad, but he was certainly one of them. He used to go around accosting people in the... The philosophy center. Yeah, and and he used to just ask people questions until they submitted. Yeah, he used to go, oh, what's a horse? And they go, oh, I don't know, about 60 quid. No, what, what's, what is a horse? And they go, oh, well, it's a big creature with four legs. And you go, oh, okay, so is every creature that's big and has four legs a horse? Well, no, there's elephants and giraffes. Oh, okay. So what makes a horse then? Well, you can ride on it. He would just ask questions and questions and questions. He sounds incredible. Uh, insufferable. <laughs> yeah, totally obnoxious. That's why he was executed. Yeah, they made him drink poison. It was just like, yeah. I've had enough of this guy. There's just two ancient Greek dudes hanging out in the philosophy center and just chatting away just like oh yeah maybe i've heard there might be war with sparta oh shit it's socrates he's here act normal hey guys ever wonder if we're all living in a cave <laughs> oh, man, we're not man like this guy <laughs> look i do shadow puppets and we don't want to see the shadow puppets again not again this is the thing about philosophy in general it's all about like contrary knowledge it's all about going Oh, you think the world works this way? Well, what if it worked like this? <laughs> I think the world goes a little something like this. <laughs> 
He was charged and found guilty of blasphemy. Yes. And for corrupting the youth, I think. Well, yes, he had a bit of a history of that, didn't he? Allegedly. <laughs> not not the sodomy. Um, <laughs> they mean, like, corrupting the youth's minds. Yes. By doing the blasphemy. There's that famous painting of him being handed his poison. He was, like, 72 or something when he died, I think. So ah. I think the idea was that he figured, well, what I got now is further decline. <laughs> I guess I may as well go. <laughs> Boy, he's loving it. He's that loving one. it. <laughs> Chugging it down. So this is what I've always been waiting yeah. for. This is why I've been annoying you all <laughs> for so long. Anyway... So I was correct. Like, everyone's interpreted this <laughs> painting to mean like, oh, I'm so sad, when really they're just like, thank God, he's finally gonna shut the fuck up. On the left here with the curly hair, he's just slamming his head against the wall. Shut up, shut up. This <laughs> dude, he's a little more tolerant. This dude is going, just drink it. Just come on, man. Hurry up. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then this guy's got his hand over his ears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he actually does. Just like, this guy has got to go. <laughs> anyway, so that's the reason why season eight of Game of Thrones wasn't actually that bad. <laughs> oh, fuck. Don't throw rocks in a glass house. Never quite understood the meaning of that phrase. What, of glass houses? Yeah, so why shouldn't people... I mean, obviously, <laughs> they shouldn't throw rocks in a glass oh. house to break the glass, but what are they... What kind of behaviour is that supposed to... Uh, it's a thing against hypocrisy, so uh -huh. a small amount of criticism in return could also do a huge amount of damage because the person who's living in the glass house is guilty of so much. That's what I was missing. Guilty of walking around in just a t-shirt. Not completely naked, a t-shirt. Yeah. That, I just think that's more offensive. We can do fables, right? Yeah, let's do fables. Yeah, okay. <laughs> What, Aesop's? Aesop's and the Grimm's ones, they're good. Aesop, I've always thought, is just such a, a stupid name. Like, yeah. it reminds me of, um, you ever have a bad handshake? Of course, yes. It reminds me of that phenomenon where someone just puts their limp hand in your hand to shake it. You go, oh yeah, that's an Aesop. That's... <laughs> That's, <laughs> you know that I mean? is oh, because it's almost like an onomatopoeia <laughs> because that's what the handshake sounds like as well but a sop yeah yeah always oh, giving me a bloody ace off oh, i'm doing all the way there is of course the the other bad form of handshake which is the overly aggressive mm. asserting dominance handshake that's what you call a grim that's a grim handshake i like it a short story typically with animals as characters conveying oh. a moral oh okay i only know about three of these fables Maybe four. Okay, so there's the turtle and the hare, the scorpion and the frog, the fox with the grapes. Oh, I don't know that one. You don't know sour grapes? No. Oh, is that is it where the term comes from? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you, so oh, this is a nice yeah, little Yeah, this is a lovely little Look website. Read.gov. Yeah. This is what the government wants okay. you to read. Government sanctioned mythology right here. Don't listen to them. A fox one day spied a beautiful bunch of ripe grapes hanging from a vine. The grapes seemed ready to burst with juice, and the fox's mouth watered as he gazed longingly at them. The bunch hung from the high branch, and the fox had to jump for it. The first time he jumped, he missed it by a long way. So he walked off a short distance and took a running leap at it, only to fall short once again. And again, and again he tried, but in vain. Now he sat down and looked at the grapes in disgust. What a fool I am, he said. Here I am wearing myself out to get a bunch of sour grapes that are not worth, you know, grasping for. And he walked off very, very scornfully. Ah. Yeah, so he's like, well, I don't fucking want it anyway. Uh, bitch grapes, you know. There are those who pretend. So that's where the term sour grapes comes ah, from. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's actually a really good story. All right, we're going to look at some images, and you tell me which myth this is from. This is going to be like a quiz. Audience, you can join in on this one. Myth busters, if you... Oh, wait, that one's taken. Myth destroyers. Myth pounders. Okay, what's that? That's an underworld story, for sure. Yeah, this is those three ladies, what, only Cher and I? Oh, yeah, I remember hearing that. as a, I haven't thought about that myth since I was a kid. It's super creepy. Mmm, and so everybody's life has a string, and then they cut the string. What? It's no good. They've got the titles at the top here. Alright, look yeah, away. I would have got that one anyway. It's fine. <laughs> Alright, who's this? Oh, it's Thingy. She it's, she's got a box. She's, uh, I know who uh, she is. I can remember, I've seen that box before. <laughs> oh, okay. Look at this one. Hey, who's this? It's, oh, it's, well, that's Medusa 
Mizuki's head in the middle. So, um, who cut off Mizuki's head? I'm not giving you any clues. I can't, it's, it's in, I a, actually can't it's in another episode in the field. You should know this one. Oh, a real fan would know. Yeah. Perseus. Yay! Who's this? Uh, old guy dying. Yep. Authority figures there. Lots of people are trying to kill him. It's Jeffrey Epstein. Murder of Jeffrey Epstein. You got it. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> Who's this fella? That can only be Hercules. Mm. I would not be fighting a lion nudes. Add time. Nord, activate. This is a message to everyone out there. Our privacy is in danger. We have to do something. 68% off a two-year plan. Protect your internet privacy. International content. Plus a free extra month. David and Goliath? I think that one's pretty good. What's the um, moral of David and Goliath? I think it's supposed to be about sort of overcoming the odds. But I, I've heard an interpretation by Malcolm Gladwell that I thought was really good. Have you ever heard this one where it's like- I don't think I have. What does Gladys say? You've got two armies yeah. and you're crossed from one another on a field. You're there in the Bronze Age. You're about to stab each other with these horribly blunt weapons and, and hurt each other and maim each other. And you know, you might have 2,000 troops on one side, 2,000 troops on the other, and you're all fairly evenly matched. The idea is that, you know what, instead of 4,000 of us getting potentially injured or killed, we'll take our strongest fighter and put him on the front lines, and you take your strongest fighter and put him on the front lines, and these two will duel, and whoever wins, wins the battle. See, that's really good diplomacy. It, I think we should do that now. It is a good idea, right? His argument is that actually David had a, a massive advantage all along. Technology. Yeah, well, basically. Yeah. He goes into what effectively a slingshot was back in the day. Mm. So apparently these guys used to be incredibly accurate with their slingshots. You know, they all used to practice slinging because they were, they were shepherds and so that was your main weapon against things that were going to eat your flock. Wolves. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and foxes and large crows and such. Monsters that live <laughs> in the backs of theatres. Yeah, Mento. Yeah, like really good ideas, IP-wise, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> the other thing about a, a sling is that actually it's an incredibly powerful weapon. Like you can very easily kill someone with a sling. They've recorded it's like the equivalent of like a 32 caliber bullet mm. if you get hit by a rock uh, from a sling. And so basically it's the story of a man with a knife going up against a man with a gun. Yeah, it, the moral of the story is bring a gun to a knife fight. Or at least wear a helmet. <laughs> yes. That is the lesson according to Goliath, if you take his perspective. Mm. If David comes along and he goes, oh, you know what, I'm the toughest fighter from my village, and then Goliath's like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fuck you up, kid. And then David goes, oh, <laughs> I found a stone, uh, look at this. <laughs> and then basically hits him with, a, with the gun of their day. Yeah. You'd be like, you can't just, <laughs> this is cheating. And everybody charge, you know? You're right, it was like set up like this samurai duel of honor. Mm. And this kid walks up and hollows some guy's head <laughs> out in front of everyone. <laughs> to be fair though, it's consistent with David's character. Do you know what he ends up doing after this? Uh, goes on massive bender. He I, does do that, invades loads of places, becomes king. Oh, right. Yeah? So a bit of an upgrade from Shepherd. He becomes yeah. king of Israel. And then he spots a woman that he really likes far away, taking a shower from his palace, and he's like, I like her. Really? 
yeah, he sees this beautiful, I've like, never seen a woman that beautiful before. This is a part of the story that I've never quite understood about, is that he sees this woman bathing from his palace, so I don't know how he's managing that. But well, she's living in a glass house. That, there we go, <laughs> that explains it, perfect. Um, anyway, so he goes over and she's like, I'm the king, so you should, you know, you should think about upgrading. Hmm. And she's like, well, actually, my husband fights in your army, so it'd be a little bit dishonorable. So David goes back, finds out who this guy is, sends him to the front line and has him killed and takes his wife. Oh. That's the story, yeah. That's not so pleasant. What's your favorite myth? My favorite myth? Ooh, King Midas is one of my favorites. The king who wishes to turn everything to gold. Yes. So there's a guy. Mm. His name's Midas. One day... Oh, who the hell's Ovid? Oh, he's a poet. He wrote the Metamorphoses. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the uh, myths are sort of formalized because he's the first one who actually got it down on paper. All right, so he retains the copyright. Yes, exactly. He <laughs> so one day uh, Dionys found that his old schoolmaster and foster father... The satyr Silenus. The old satyr had been drinking wine and wandering away drunk to be found by some Pythagian peasants who carried him to their king Midas. Midas treated him nice, 10 days in hospital, told him stories and songs. For a, someone governing a major Greek state, he's got a lot of time on his hands. And on the, the 11th day, he brought him back to Dionysus, the god of debauchery and drinking, and then he gets a reward. You may have one wish. And then, oddly, he decides, anything I touch will turn into gold? Um, Midas rejoices at his new power, which he has hastened to put to the test. He touches an oak twig and a stone, both turn to gold. Overjoyed, as soon as he got home, he touched every rose in the rose garden, and they all became gold. He ordered the servants to set a feast on the table. Upon discovering how even the food and drink turned to gold in his hands, okay, he regretted his wish and cursed it. Here's one loophole I don't think he thought of. Hmm. Could he not hold something and then have the thing that he actually wants to hold in the thing? They said that he was about to starve to death so must not have worked otherwise uh, i mean unless he's just dumb like really dumb <laughs> like keeps picking up another apple and go oh, not this one again well, i wonder <laughs> if this is in some way linked to the magical gambit i made earlier this afternoon dude that'd be the worst could you imagine like testing all that stuff because i suppose you'd go like i'm so hungry i guess i won't use my hands then so you get some chopsticks and you start putting stuff in your mouth and then it touches your lips, then it just turns to gold. That would be the worst. Does gold just taste like pennies? I, because it's gold, I assume it tastes better than the inferior metals. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, I think uh, it's got like even less flavor than yeah, pennies. It's just pennies. There's nothing worse. You're in a situation and you accidentally taste pennies because you know something's gone mm. wrong. It's like, oh, oh not, not the penny taste. <laughs> Hold on, so is he turning the air particles? that go into his lungs into gold? Because you're breathing in bits of dust too. Surely they would turn to gold. Yes, so I think particles or maybe gases are exempt mm. from his gold touching right. powers. Mm. No, wait, his clothes, the clothes on his body yes. would instantly turn to gold then. You would think. You would think. I think, as is the nature of myths, I think they have to sacrifice a bit of conceptual clarity. And when you have a character like the Hulk show up like he's always got to break his clothes in the right way otherwise you just have would have to have a, a bit of exposition in every film of just like oh, do you see the did you see the hulk's <laughs> cock <laughs> yeah it, it is distressingly big i'm scared <laughs> it's exceedingly muscular foreskin and scrotum <laughs> the loophole is necessary for storytelling as well as everything else i suppose mm, yeah yeah bro uh, uh, it's no, never mind, never mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw that thought away. It was just more about the Hulk's balls. Go on. <laughs> I know, tell me more about the Hulk's balls. That's great. <laughs> well, I don't know, is it regenerative? If you got, like, circumcised as a kid or something, does the, like, does it grow back? I would pres <laughs> Does the Hulk have regenerative powers or is he just super strong? <laughs> does that, is that what happens to Wolverine, though? Yeah, I mean, you can almost certainly suggest that Wolverine is uncircumcised. In a version told by Nathaniel Hawthorne, mm. Midas's daughter. <sighs> Wait a minute. Is the daughter thing not in the original? The King Midas's daughter is not canon. What the fuck? In the version told by Nathaniel Hawthorne in the Wonder Book for Boys and Girls. 
It's nice. It's a nice title. That's so wholesome. The Wonder Book. <laughs> And Midas' daughter came to him, upset about the roses and that had lost their fragrance and became hard. And when he reached out to comfort her, found that he touched his daughter and she turned soon to... So that version of the story... Ah, it's from 1852. Didn't know that. Ah. Oh, Honestly, that's a, that's a genuine improvement. Yeah, it's kind of like the peak of the, the conflict yeah. in the story. Yeah, it's good. It's way better storytelling. Well done, Nathaniel mm. Hawthorne. You've improved a classic. Mm. You say we should write a wonder book for girls and boys. We should get Nathaniel in on it. The wonder book for e-girls and incels. Mm. That's not bad. Buy a wonder book for <laughs> e-girls and incels. As approved by the internet historian, that's canon now and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Midas didn't do anything wrong he shouldn't really be punished forever no disagree oh okay <laughs> fair enough uh, Midas did so and when he touched the waters the power flowed into the river and the river sands turned into gold oh. uh, this explained why the river Pactolus was so rich in gold we were wrong this whole time this isn't a story about like not being materialistic uh, it's just a story about why there's gold in the river <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah, I love that idea. Like, Ovid shows up. Yeah. He's like, what? Is that what you took from the story? No, no, I was explaining why I'm holding this gold pan <laughs> and, and up to me ankles. I feel like this myth is just constantly misunderstood. It is about properly checking for loopholes in whatever agreement you make. Be greedy, but be smartly yes. greedy. If King Midas had gone to his attorney and said, I just want you to maybe look at this witch and see if there might be anything that might backfire <laughs> dramatically. You're allowed to put caveats with your wish, right? So surely you could get around all of this stuff by just adding a clause that says, in the way that I hope for and the desired results expect. That's great. That is the perfect magic wish loophole avoider. That's what King Midas should have done. Yep, he should have talked to us first. Exactly. He should have consulted us. <laughs> I'm sure there's practical uses for it, though. Like, if you were... No, hold on. There must be one practical use of being able to immediately turn something into gold. I'm trying to think about because the main thing is to have a lot of gold. Okay, I've got one. I'm impressed that you've got even one because I've been trying to think of one. You're at war uh -huh. with the Japanese. Not again. Okay, no, no, no. You're at war and you decide to hire some Japanese ninjas. Cool. You could take out some parchment and cut it into shuriken or whatever they're- Shurikens. Shuriken, yeah. Shaped stars and then have Midas go shwing over them and then you could probably still throw them. Shall we wrap it up there? We need um, yeah. we need a bit of an outro, innit? Yeah. Oh. Let's do something brave and original. Well, I'm about to jump into my Hindenburg 2 and float away. I'm going to go sleep in my glass house, unlike all you losers who can't even be seen while sleeping. <laughs> all right. See you later. See you later. Oh, no. <laughs> Ordinary things, why did you put that massive antenna on the top of your glass house? No! It's the only way I can know the truth! <laughs> uh, <laughs> the humanity. Okay, I've got to go now. I'm being beamed up by 8G signals, so it's gonna be really fast. Go on, go on, go on. I gotta go, I'm dead. For a big fireball. Subscribe to Ordinary Things, he's criminally undersubbed. Also, get Nord, Nord VPN. <laughs>